and welcome to another lecture in the general music series. Um, today's topic is a George Gershwin. He's a great American composer. And uh, to start us off, I'd like to start with uh, a quote by Gershwin. And here's something that Gershwin said. The composer does not sit around and wait for an inspiration to walk up and introduce itself. Uh, making music is actually little else than a matter of invention, aided and abetted by emotion. In composing, we combine what we know of music with what we feel. George Gershwin was born Jacob Bruskin Gershowitz in 1898, and he lived until 1937. He was an American composer and pianist whose compositions spanned both popular and classical genres. A genre is a type of music, if you will. Uh, he was only 39 when he died, um, which leaves many of us to wonder what he might have written if he'd had a longer life, but his impact in the short time that he had was absolutely huge. A little bit about Gershwin's uh, early days. Uh, Gershwin's parents were um, immigrants of Russian Jewish and Lithuanian Jewish ancestry, and they grew up in Brooklyn, um, Brooklyn, New York. The family lived in many different residences, and uh, the boys, uh, Ira and George, um, grew up mostly in the Yiddish theater district. It was a whole bunch of different um, Jewish theaters, Yiddish theaters that were, were there in Brooklyn. So George and Ira frequented these local theaters, um, with George occasionally appearing on stage as an extra um, at a very young age. Uh, he, they, you know, George lived a boyhood which was not unusual in the New York tenements, uh, which included running around with his friends and roller skating and misbehaving in the streets. And until 1908, uh, he didn't really care about music. Then, as a 10-year-old, he was uh, he went to his friend Maxie Rosenweig's uh, violin recital, and the sound and the way his friend played, just the whole experience, just captivated him. It moved him. And about the same time, uh, George's parents had bought a piano uh, for his older brother Ira. And to his parents' surprise, strangely enough, and, and to Ira's relief, uh, it was George who spent more time playing it as he started to learn about music and started to enjoy being a musician. Well, with a degree of frustration, uh, George tried various piano teachers for about two years uh, before finally being introduced to uh, Charles Hambitzer uh, by Jack Miller. Um, uh, Hambitzer was the pianist in the Beethoven Symphony Orchestra. Uh, now, until his death in 1918, Hambitzer um, remained Gershwin's musical mentor and taught him conventional piano technique and, m maybe more importantly, uh, introduced him to the music of uh, the European classical tradition and encouraged George, George, you got to get out, you've got to attend orchestral concerts, you've got to become a student of music. You need to expose yourselves to great composers. And uh, the impact he had was just huge. The right teacher, right time. And so by 1913, uh, Gershwin leaves school at the age of 15 and finds his first job as a uh, song plugger, which means that he played new compositions for people to hear so they could buy the sheet music. Um, this is before the age of good recordings. So if you're trying to sell a piece of music, uh, people were like, well, what's it sound like? So George would, would sing it and play it. And, um, George's employer was uh, Jerome H. Remick & Co., which was a De Detroit-based publishing firm, but it had a branch office in New York City's Tin Pan Alley. And uh, George earned the princely sum of $15 a week. Now, George's first published song happened not that long after this, and it, the title was, When You Want Them, You Can't Get Them. When You've Got Them, You Don't Want Them. And he published this in 1916 when he was only 17 years old, and it earned him 50 cents. Whoo! Uh, in 1919, George got his first take, a uh, taste of commercial success. Um, when he scored his first big national hit with the song Swanee, with words by Irving Caesar. Uh, Al Jolson, a famous Broadway singer of the day, heard Gershwin perform Swanee at a party, 
and he decided to sing it in one of his shows, and it became a very popular piece of music um, for Al Jolson, and Al Jolson um, continued to use that as one of his signature pieces, although when we get into that history, it's um, a difficult one because Jolson often, unfortunately, performed the piece in, in blackface. Uh, anyhow, returning back to Gershwin. In 1924, uh, Gershwin composes his first major classical work, Rhapsody in Blue for Orchestra and Piano. And it, it was a major work, major hit. It was orchestrated by Ferdé Grofet, and it was premiered by Paul Whiteman's concert band in New York. And subsequently, it went on to be his most popular work and it established Gershwin's signature style and his genius in blending vastly different musical styles in revolutionary ways. Because at this point, George Gershwin is, um, he's formed in this crucible of American music. He's listening to jazz, he's exposed to jazz, he's exposed to popular music, and yet he's a student of the European classical tradition and the intersection, the, the smashing of these styles that come together is so uniquely Gershwin and so uniquely American that even today the music sounds fresh and meaningful. After the success of Rhapsody in Blue in the mid-twenties, um, Gershwin decided to uh, try and be a more serious composer, and uh, he stayed in Paris for a period of time, um, during which he applied to study composition with the noted N Nadia Boulanger, who, along with uh, several other prospective uh, teachers and tutors, uh, such as Maurice Ravel, uh, turned him down. Um, apparently afraid that the rigorous classical study would ruin his jazz-influenced style. Um, in fact, uh, it was a very personal thing. They, they didn't want to ruin Gershwin. Uh, Maurice Ravel's rejection letter to Gershwin uh, told him, eh, Why do you want to become a second-rate Ravel when you are already a first-rate Gershwin? And uh, when Ravel heard how much Gershwin earned, um, <laughs> Ravel replied with words to the effect, you should give me lessons. Um, some versions of the story actually uh, feature Igor Stravinsky rather than Ravel as the composer. Uh, however, later when he was at Princeton, um, Stravinsky confirmed that he originally heard the story uh, from Ravel. Anyhow, um, suffice it to say, George was heavily influenced uh, by the French composers of the early 20th century. And in turn, Maurice Ravel was very impressed with Gershwin's abilities, commenting, Personally, I found the jazz the most interesting. The rhythms, the way the melodies are handled, the melodies themselves. I have heard George Gershwin's works, and I find them intriguing. When you look at the orchestrations in Gershwin's work, and you look at the, the way it's voiced, um, the orchestrations in those symphonic works often seem similar to those of Ravel. Uh, likewise, when you look at Ravel's two piano concertos, you can really hear that influence of Gershwin. Um, while he was in Paris, um, Gershwin, although he was unsuccessful finding a teacher, did write An American in Paris, which is a, a major work. Um, the work uh, received mixed reviews uh, on its first performance at Carnegie Hall in, in New York City on December 13th in 1928, but quickly it became part of the standard repertoire in both the United States and also um, on, on concert bills in Europe as well. And on a personal note, I gotta tell you that this is one of my favorite pieces of work and I was lucky enough to catch it at the opening of the National Symphony in Washington, D.C. last year. And in that score, you can really hear the hustle and bustle of life in Paris in the bicycle horns that he uses uh, to punctuate the score. 
Now, after he returned to New York City, um, he wrote Porgy and Bess with Ira, Ira, his brother, and DuBose Hayward. Um, Porgy and Bess is an American opera featuring um, black performers. And initially it was a commercial failure, but it came to be considered one of the most important operas of the 20th century and an American cultural classic. Um, in terms of a stage production, Porgy and Bess was also one of the first major operas to feature black performers and in, indeed black performers throughout all of the roles, not just the lead roles. Um, so, after the commercial failure of Porgy and Bess, uh, Gershwin decided, okay, it's time to make some bank. He moves to Hollywood. And um, in 1936, he's commissioned by RKA Pictures to write music for the film Shall We Dance, starring Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Uh, that extended score, which marries uh, ballet with jazz, uh, and it marries them in such a new and interesting way. It runs over an hour in length, and it took him months to compose and orchestrate. Unfortunately, here's where we start to get to the end of the story. Early in 1937, uh, Gershwin began to complain of blinding headaches and a recurring impression that he smelled burning rubber. And uh, during a concert in February of 1937, he was performing piano concerto in F, and it, it, it really didn't go well. Gershwin, normally a superb pianist of his own compositions, uh, he suffered co coordination problems and blackouts during that performance. And not long after, although he had surgery for a brain tumor, uh, he passed away in July of 1937. Um, far too young. There are a limited number of American musicians who are com considered serious composers, and Gershwin has to be numbered among the greatest. Gershwin's musical voice was uniquely his own, but clearly he was influenced uh, by especially French composers. Um, his concerto in F was criticized for being related to the work of Claude Debussy, um, more so than to the expected American jazz style that people were thinking he was going to be writing in more. Um, this comparison did not deter him from continuing to explore French styles. Uh, the title of An American in Paris reflects the very journey that he had consciously taken as a composer. Um, in his, in his program notes, he writes, the, the opening part will be developed in typical French style in the matter of Debussy and Les Six, although the tunes are original. Um, Gershwin was intrigued and influenced by the works of Alban Berg, Dmitry Shostakovich, Igor Stravinsky, uh, Darius Milo, and Arnold Schoenberg. And he also asked Schoenberg... <laughs> Another story of, of him asking for teachers. He also asked Schoenberg for composition lessons, and Schoenberg refused, saying, I can't do a German accent. I would only make you a bad Schoenberg, and you're such a good Gershwin already. No, that sounded more like Arnold. Sorry. Anyhow, what set Gershwin apart was his ability uh, to manipulate forms of music into his own unique voice. He took the jazz he discovered on Tin Pan Alley and he took it into the mainstream by splicing its rhythms and its tonality with that of popular songs of his era. And uh, although George Gershwin would seldom make uh, sweeping or grand statements about his music, he believed that, quote, true music must reflect the thought and aspirations of the people and time. My people are Americans. My time is today. George Gershwin, a truly great American composer. In the links you'll find examples that have been playing behind me as I was speaking, and you'll have a chance to listen to um, Rhapsody in Blue and American Paris. Um, enjoy. They're really great pieces of music.